Uh, well, welcome to our credit uh, College Credit Plus or CCP for short virtual information session. My name is Donald Bean and I serve as a College Credit Plus coordinator here at the Kent State University at East Liverpool campus. And let me just begin by saying thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening, especially during this time of the year when there's a lot to do and a lot going on. Um, we certainly recognize schedules are busy. Your time is valuable and we are going to do our absolute best to honor that tonight by being one as brief as possible while also giving you all the information you need regarding this great program and this great opportunity. So let me just give you a quick overview of tonight's agenda. We are going to begin with a presentation on the what and the why of College Credit Plus. Um, this presentation is going to give you an overview of the College Credit Plus program. It's going to talk about eligibility criteria to participate in the program, the types of courses you can take, how College Credit Plus courses are going to impact your high school graduation requirements, and then some of the benefits and potential risks of participating in the program. After this, CCP representatives from Eastern Gateway Community College, myself representing Kent State University, and we have a representative from Youngstown State University here tonight. They're all going to briefly discuss the admission process and the requirements for their respective institutions. And then these representatives, along with your school counselors, will also be available to answer questions via the chat function. So as we're going through the presentation, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer those in real time. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and access to the recording will be provided to all schools participating this evening, which means that you will have access to the recording again at a later date if that is helpful for you. So let's get into it. What is College Credit Plus? College Credit Plus is the state of Ohio's dual credit program where students can earn high school and college credit at the same time. It is open to Ohio residents in grades 7 through 12 who are enrolled at a public private high school or who are homeschooled. It allows students to take a variety of courses at any public and participating private college in Ohio. And these courses can be held at the high school. They could be held on a college campus or a lot of students will take courses online. And I think with all three of the schools, um, here this evening, Wellsville, East Liverpool, and Southern, you all have really those three opportunities available to you. Uh, the program also permits students to take classes during the fall, spring, and summer semesters. So keep in mind that we're on at the university or college level on a different schedule than the high schools. We operate in semesters. Our academic year begins in summer, then we have a fall semester and a spring semester, and students can participate in each of those. So then the question becomes, how can students participate? And there's a couple of steps to this process. The first step, a student is going to be eligible for the CCP program if they meet any one of the following criteria. So has obtained a remediation free score on one of the standard ass assessment exams. Those are going to be things like the ACT, the SAT, or an in-house test that we will offer, um, I think, from all three of our uh, organizations here tonight called something like the AccuPlacer or Alex. You have to um, or have a cumulative unweighted high school grade point average of at least 3.0. Now you'll notice it says high school grade point average. So if you are a student who's in sixth or seventh grade now and will be going into seventh or eighth grade next year, or you're an eighth grader going into ninth grade, you do not yet have a high school GPA. Now, you may, if you're an eighth grader taking college algebra or high school algebra um, as an eighth grader, but you don't have a GPA yet. You won't have that till the end of the year. So in those cases, middle school students without that high school GPA are going to have to meet a remediation free score on one of the standardized uh, assessment exams. The third way you can uh, meet eligibility requirements is to have a cumulative unweighted high school GPA average of at least 2.75, but then less than a 3.0. So it's kind of that middle ground, and then have received an A or B grade in a relevant high school course. So that's step one, the eligibility and how you can participate. Step two to the participation process is being admitted to a college or university. So 
The next step, if you are eligible based on the prior criteria, is to apply to the college of your choice. Now, keep in mind, you can take courses at multiple institutions at the same time. So you could apply to Eastern Gateway, Kent State University, and YSU, and take courses at each of our institutions in the same academic school year. That is possible and um, allowable. Now, keep in mind, though, that admission is going to be um, it's going to be monitored and essentially governed by each college or university. College applications are also going to include a permission slip for what we call mature content and a questionnaire about emotional maturity. And one of the little sidebar regarding that, we do like to remind parents and students that if you participate in the CCP program, you are treated like a regular college student. And therefore, you may be exposed to content in a class that you wouldn't be exposed to in a middle school or high school level. So those are certainly things you want to consider as you're going through this process. Um, and lastly, colleges will have the final decision on student admissions. So step one is to see if you're eligible to participate in the program. Step two is to apply to the college or colleges of your choice. So assuming you're eligible, assuming you've applied and been accepted to a school or multiple schools, the next step is to register for your courses. And how is this done? The college is going to discuss the course options with the student. Those are going to be based on any assessment scores that have taken place if necessary, prerequisites to courses and other requirements. So for instance, you can't take college writing two until you've completed college writing one or you have some sort of testing proficiency to that effect. So there are sometimes prerequisites that have to be met to take certain courses. School counselors are gonna help in this process, especially with helping you as a student and the family understand how the requirements you're taking with us or the courses you're taking at the college level are going to substitute for requirements at the high school. So for instance, if you take an English with us, that should replace an English requirement for you at the high school so that you don't need to take that English class at the high school level. And then we do develop things that are called pathways in 15 and 30 credit hour um, increments that'll help you determine your plan. Students aren't limited to only taking courses in the pathways. They really just exist as a guide and a resource, but they can be helpful. And that's something that your college academic advisor or school counselor could talk to you about. So let's talk a little bit about course eligibility rules. So College Credit Plus does say that students must complete their first 15 credits in what are called level one courses. And these are courses that are going to include things like highly transferable courses. Um, these are typically courses that fall into what we would call a core curriculum or general requirements. Things like English writing, uh, maybe some math, uh, histories, fine arts like musics or art histories, maybe philosophies. Uh, psychology, sociology, some of your basic sciences. They're courses that if you take them and go to another school, they're highly transferable. Courses in IT, computer science, anatomy, physiology, foreign language requirement or courses would count. Courses that are part of a technical certificate. Courses that are part of that 15 or 30 credit pathway or pathways that we discussed on the previous slide. And then courses in study skills, academic or career success. Now, once you've completed your first 15 credits in this level one set of courses, then you can move on to what are level two courses, which really are anything in the course catalog that you meet the prerequisite for and or are allowable through the CCP program. There are some non-allowable courses in the CCP program, and those are gonna apply to things like um, courses with one-on-one -on -one instruction, such as performing art lessons. So if, if you're really hoping to you know, pick up the guitar, meet with somebody and become the next John Mayer or something. Unfortunately, you can't do that through the CCP program. This will include things like courses with high fees. So here at Kent State, we have a flight program. Um, becoming a pilot is very expensive because you have to pay for flight time. Um, so that would be an example of a course with very high fee that would be excluded from the CCP program. Study abroad courses, unfortunately, you can't um, leave the country and go stay in another country and learn in that environment, which is a great opportunity for traditional students, but not available to CCP students. Physical education courses are disallowed. Past fail graded courses are disallowed. So if you're taking a CCP course, it does have to be graded in standard uh, way, you know, A, B, C, D, et cetera. And remedial courses or sectarian religious courses are disallowed as well. Remedial courses um, 
at the college level would be a course we might have somebody take if they need to do a little bit of catch up work in something like math. So let's say a student is in a program that requires a college algebra. They come in, they take an exam, a placement exam, and really they're they're at a high school algebra level. We would have them take a remedial course to catch up so that they could go into the course they need for graduation at the college level. For CCP, if that is going to be um, where you're you're at based on your placement, we're just going to tell you to take a high school course because essentially that's what a remedial course is. How many courses can a student take? Students are permitted to be enrolled in up to 30 credits a year, but that includes your high school courses. And you'll see there's a little formula here for how this is calculated. So let's start with that number 30, um, which is your max. And let's pause for a second and just remind ourselves that at the college level, most courses are going to be three credits a piece. Three credits a piece. So let's start with the number 30. And now we have to factor in what you're taking at the high school. So let's just use a, an easy analogy. If let's say a student's taking a math, for a full credit, an English for a full credit, a social studies for a full credit, a science for a full credit, and a foreign language for a full credit. They're taking five full credits at their high school. We would multiply the number five by three. That's what we see in parentheses, and that would give you the number 15. So we would have to subtract the 15 credits you're taking at your high school from the total allowed to you per year which would leave you with 15 credits at the college level or five classes. So that is um, something that we always have to take into consideration. Now, when we think about the total number of credits a student can take um, for the duration of their time in College Credit Plus, that is 120 credits, which is essentially equivalent to a, bac a bachelor degree. I I've never seen a student do that. I suppose it could be possible. I will say it's, it's very highly unlikely. Um, that that's going to take place, but it is something that theoretically could happen. And then if a student enrolls in more than 30 credits for the year, so let's say, you know, you're at 33, at that point, you have two options. You could drop the course um, and not have any consequence for doing so, or you can keep the course, but at that point, you would have to pay for the course under something we call option A. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what really stinks about that is you actually don't pay the discounted rate for CCP that your high school is paying, you end up paying the full price of that course. So most students opt not to go over the 30 credits. Some additional considerations as you're thinking about whether or not College Credit Plus is for you. Keep in mind that the final grades you earn on your college course are gonna be the same grade that is on your high school transcript. So if you earn a grade of A with us at the college level, awesome, it's gonna be an A on your high school transcript. If you earn a grade of F on your college transcript, it is going to show as an F on your high school transcript and is obviously going to impact um, uh, graduation honors, uh, your place and you know, rankings in your class. So these are things you certainly want to consider. Your grades with us will impact not only your college uh, GPA, it will impact your high school GPA and transcripts. Another thing to consider or to know is that if your high school um, has a weighted GPA or grade point average, if they weight things like um, AP courses or honors courses, CCP by law must be weighted as well. Another consideration is selective service. So male students who are at least 18 years of age and Ohio residents are required to be registered with a selective service uh, system. Students are required then to provide their selective service number to the public college or university within 30 days of their 18th birthday. Failure to submit this will result in the student not, be not being considered a College Credit Plus participant, um, and then you may be responsible for payment if you haven't done uh, disclosed that at the correct time. So that's certainly something that you need to know and be mindful of. Now let's take a couple of minutes to talk about the differences between high school and college. And this is especially important if you've um, never taken a College Credit Plus course, or maybe you're a really young student, maybe you're a sixth grader or seventh grader and you're thinking about uh, taking some courses. So when we think about study time at the high school level, your required homework may range between one to three hours per day. At the college level, it's typically gonna be a little more. 
It's usually going to be two to three hours of studying reading uh, for each hour of class. So um, if, for instance, if you were taking a traditional course on a campus that was three credit hours, that's going to translate into two and a half hours of um, classwork or two and a half hours on campus in that class per week. So you would multiply that by two to three hours of studying. Now, there's always exceptions, and there's certainly going to be courses that don't require that much that much study time and preparation, but you need to assume that it might and consider how that's going to impact your just daily schedule. Knowledge acquisition in high school, information is usually going to be provided in class, and then you're going to have assignments that, that follow so that you can kind of apply that knowledge. At the college level, oftentimes you're going to be doing that work and acquiring knowledge outside of the classroom or maybe in, van in advance of your meeting time um, so that you are prepared to have a quality in-class discussion. Tests at the high school level are often given weekly or the end of each unit. College, less frequent. Uh, you may be in a course that has three quizzes and maybe one test, um, and it's going to definitely cover a lot more material. Some more differences when we think of grades, already been discussed, numerous quizzes, tests, homework assignments, et cetera, in, in high school, definitely fewer of those at the college level. So if you have a really, really poor test score or quiz, you may have less opportunities to improve that score. Keep that in mind. Um, this one's really, really important. So the role of parents and guardians. So at high school, parents and guardians are definitely advocates. You're gonna be involved and work with your teachers and counselors to work for the best interests of your students. At the college level, the student has to be their own advocate. Um, they're treated like an adult. As a matter of fact, they even fall under what's called the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, what we call FERPA, um, at the college level, which means the information we can disclose to you as a parent is very limited and next to none because your student becomes the one who is the responsible party um, at the college level. As a matter of fact, um, one way to really potentially hurt your child's ability to succeed in the class is to be trying to intervene with that faculty member um, because they're not going to like that. So that's definitely something you want to consider. Now, that doesn't mean you can't help your student. It doesn't mean your, your student can't come to you with questions or concerns or if they're in an online class, maybe come to you with um, some help on something. But just bear in mind that you're not going to be able to be that, that mediator between the professor and the student. Accommodations. So parents and students are going to work with high school staff to determine what assistance and accommodations can be made for students with IEPs and 504 plans. Um, at the college level, the student has to take that responsibility and work with the staff to determine if accommodations are one needed and then um, what can be included or excluded from that conversation. So a lot more responsibility on the student. Now, we talked about if you're going to participate in the program, you need to be college ready. What does that mean? It is more than just being academically ready, but certainly not less. So you need to consider the emotional and social transition in college expectations, consider time management and organizational skills. I will say that I, I think social maturity and some of these things that are talked about on this slide are really about 70 to 80% of what's gonna determine whether or not the student will be successful in these courses. We have a legal obligation to make sure that students are academically ready before they take a course. Um, we can't determine whether or not that student is emotionally or socially ready to take that course. If you're a parent on the call tonight, or if you're the student, and just think to yourself, if you're the type of person that requires somebody to really push you along to get your work done, um, maybe you miss deadlines because you just forget and people got to remind you, College Credit Plus is not going to make that easier it's going to expose those challenges and potentially become detrimental to your academic performance. So um, those are the things you want to be thinking about and be honest with yourself as you uh, move forward in this process. But there are a ton of benefits to College Credit Plus. So first off, you get to earn high school and college credits at the same time. You can accelerate um, your ability to, to meet your high school graduation requirements. Like I said, if you Let's say you are a junior, and normally you would be taking a junior English at your high school. If you take a college writing course with a college university that's going to be in the fall semester, so August, late August to early December, that three-credit-hour college course, which is 16 weeks, 
is going to count for your entire year's worth of English at the high school. And then if you take college writing two in the spring semester as a junior, January to May, that will satisfy your senior English. So that dual credit is really, really a great opportunity. Second, you get a head start in career planning. Um, you can potentially earn degrees or certificates in advance. That's not impossible. We have had students do that. Um, it's also really valuable to be meeting with your college academic advisor through this process, because as you're meeting with an advisor, we're, be, we're gonna be able to start talking to you about um, major opportunities and how the courses you're taking are gonna apply to different majors um, so that you're you're getting a head start on that, that process. Um, and, and the big one, you see the last bullet point, you save tuition and textbook costs. So the College Credit Plus program is free to students so long as they are passing the courses. So there are definitely a lot of, a lot of benefits to the program. And not only are the uh, tuition is tuition covered, but so are your book costs. Now, there are some consequences though, if you don't, um, if you underperform or you're not passing your courses. You may be asked to reimburse your local school district if the student does not earn a passing grade in their course. So if they fail a course, or if the student withdraws after the no fault deadline. So there's always a period of time where a student can drop their course at zero consequence. And like I always tell students, it'll be like you never took it. But then once that window of opportunity closes, you go into what's called a withdrawal period. If you withdraw from the course, that can be a good option if you're worried about failing a course because it doesn't impact your GPA but you still may be required to pay for that course. Now, you'll see there's a note that does say that if a student is considered economically disadvantaged, they cannot be asked to reimburse the cost of the course or the courses. But you need to keep that in mind that that is a potential um, consequence of the program. There's also something called College Credit Plus probation. So students will be placed on probation if they earn less than a cumulative 2.0 GPA in their CCP courses, or they withdraw from two or more courses in one academic term. So if a student gets on probation, there's some consequences to this, and the rules are as follows. You can only enroll in one College Credit Plus course for the next semester. So if you're on probation and you were taking three courses, now you're gonna be limited to one. You're also not gonna be allowed to enroll in a college course in the same subject in which the student previously earned that D, the F, or the W, or whatever it might have been. So if it was an English course, that's now gonna be off the table. And finally, if students on CCP probation do not increase their GPA to a 2.0 or above, you will be placed on CCP dismissal. What is dismissal? Well, if you don't raise your GPA during that probationary period, you're gonna be dismissed from the CCP program. While on CCP dismissal, students may not enroll in any College Credit Plus courses, However, you can request or appeal to be reinstated into the program. So what do these appeals look like? You'll see there's an appeal for both CCP probation and dismissal. For probation, you may appeal to take courses in the same subject in which you previously earned a non-passing grade or received no credit. Um, and then for dismissal, same, same type of idea, but you must do it within five days of being dismissed. You may submit an appeal to the secondary school. That would be your high school. Secondary school equals high school to appeal your CCP dismissal or the student may appeal at the end of the CCP dismissal semester. And you'll note that each school district is gonna have a policy regarding this process and describing this process. Some other consequences if you underperform in the CCP program. Keep in mind the grades earned are gonna remain on your student's college transcript permanently. So if you earn an F in College Credit Plus, that's gonna stay with you for the rest of your life. If a student fails or withdraws often, it can also potentially, potentially impact your future financial aid. There's something we call satisfactory academic progress or SAP. Um, and this is actually a federal requirement for federal financial aid. And it essentially boils down to you need to be completing a certain percentage of the courses you are attempting. And if you fail to meet that threshold, you're going to be flagged. You're going to have to complete an appeal and you may even lose your financial aid. Um, so that's another 
thing to be considered or to consider and be mindful of. Are there any expenses? Well, there are two basic options for College Credit Plus. There's option A and option B. Option A requires families to pay. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. You'll see that you can choose. I don't know why you would, but you can choose to self-pay for your college courses at the standard rate of tuition fees and textbooks, not the discounted rate the schools get. Um, and this also allows you to earn College Credit Plus without it going in your high school transcript. This is, I've never even had this happen, but it is an option. But since it's so rare, we're going to spend more time on option B, which you'll see is the default or standard option for CCP. So under this plan, all college course tuition fees and textbooks are paid by the state of Ohio. And then this is supported. How, are, how is this paid? Your high school is picking up a, a piece of that pie and they're paying um, for uh, tuition and books. And the colleges and universities like here at YSU and at Kent State, we're giving a reduced tuition so that the schools aren't paying the full price. And then under this program, you earn both college and high school credit. OK, so you're in the program, but you're wondering what sort of support support services are available to you as a student. So um, you're still going to have support from the high school. You're still going to have access to your school counselors that can talk to you about all the things they typically help you with, graduation requirements, career paths, et cetera. Um, but you're also going to be assigned a college advisor, and we're going to be able to talk to you about your future goals as it relates to your academic um, progression at the college level, majors you might want to pursue, courses that would align with those goals and those potential majors you might want to take. Um, we can talk to you about all of that, financial aid, scholarships, the whole gamut. Um, and basically, it boils down to if we offer a service at the college level to one of our traditional students, that service has to be available to College Credit Plus students as well. Athletic ability. So if you are an athlete, you definitely want to make sure you understand eligibility requirements. I would encourage you to talk to your counselors about this. Keep in mind that if you do take a summer CCP course, and we're going to talk about whether or not you would want to do that in a moment, um, they do not count towards your, um, your athletic eligibility. Another big question is, are these course credits I take going to transfer? So those level one courses that we talked about, those highly transferable courses, absolutely. Um, if you stay within the state of Ohio and you go to another public institution, your courses are going to transfer, really by law. If you go to a private institution in the state of Ohio, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying that they're most likely going to transfer because as Ohio institutions, this is now just the air we breathe and everybody's playing, um, trying to play well with the new CCP requirements. Um, there are possibilities if you go out of state or if you go to a private school out of state um, or even a private school in the state of Ohio, your credits may not transfer, um, but most likely they will. And again, that's why the advising process at the college level is so helpful because we can go into much greater detail about how that works and also how there's a difference between courses transferring and how those courses will actually apply to your future degree. So that's something we'll get into a lot more detail down the road when you're being advised. For your college courses, but suffice it to say that um, it's a yes and no answer, but heavier on the yes. All right, so with all that information in mind, let's start to talk about deadlines and let's talk about next steps. So all students, whether you're new or returning, are required to provide the intent to participate form to your school counselor. Um, return that to your uh, counselor ASAP. You don't have to wait till April 1st. You can knock it out now. And I would suspect that each of your counselors will be providing that um, info to you regarding how you can pick that, that form up, um, probably by going to their office. So uh, make sure you're knocking that out by April 1st. Super important. Remember, you can always apply and change your mind about taking the course. Every year we have students that go through the process, apply, get accepted, have an advising appointment, and decide not to take a course. That is perfectly fine. But if you miss these deadlines, and you don't do the intent to participate, and then you don't apply to a college, sometimes it's very, if, if you miss those deadlines, oftentimes you're, it's too late and there's nothing that can be done. So it's always better to err on the side of, if you think you're going to go ahead and go through the process, you can change your mind later. Check ACT and SAT testing dates. I know Eastern Gateway and Kent State um, University don't require ACT um, for admission. Um, Sarah, you can chime in when you're going through YSU. I can't remember, and I apologize for that if YSU requires that. I know one time you did, but I feel like maybe that's changed. 
Semester deadlines, um, keep in mind if you're going to take summer courses, uh, the summer semester deadline is going to be earlier than fall. So if you're applying for a summer semester, that um, application is going to close much, much sooner than the fall application will. But let's take a second to talk about summer classes. Um, sometimes people think, oh, summer would be a great time for me to start because I'm going to have all this free time and I'm not going to be bogged down with all my other activities outside of school. And so I'm going to be dedicated to doing my college class. And that just makes sense. That would make sense if the courses weren't much, much shorter than a fall or spring semester course. Fall and spring courses are typically uh, 16 weeks. You're squishing that down into eight or sometimes five weeks in the summer. And so not recommended for a brand new student because it is just ridiculously fast and furious. Um, however, if you're a returning student and you've been successful with other courses and kind of know what to expect, it can be a decent option. Next steps, you're going to want to then contact the college and discuss assessment testing requirements. Um, complete your intent to participate form by April 1st. And we're going to talk to you in a minute about the admission requirements for Eastern Gateway, Kent State, and YSU. And then you're going to, after uh, you go through all this, meet with your school counselor to, dis to discuss your scheduling and graduation requirements. And then I'm just going to let this screen hover here for a minute in case you want to take a picture of it before we move on. But there's some additional resources you can access, and maybe we can throw these into the chat as well. But with that, I'm going to stop presenting. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from Eastern Gateway, Sarah Fletcher, and she's going to talk about the admission requirements um, there at Eastern Gateway. And remember, please feel free to throw any questions you have in the chat. Sarah, it is all yours. OK, let me get the share up here. Not coming over. That technology we talk about. Yep. It's telling me that I have to download it as a PowerPoint, which it is a PowerPoint already, in order for me to share it with Teams. Do you want to, um, do you have it on your screen? Can you just share your screen? Or just share that individual screen? Try that. Feel free to email it to me. I know. <laughs> I'd be happy to uh, present it for you. That's easier. Yeah, let me email it to you right now. Okay. We jinxed ourselves. We said this would not happen. That's it. We said it wouldn't happen. Famous last words. I had a feeling that was going to happen because I, I talked about it going well before <laughs> and here we go i'll let you know when i've received it i'm gonna go ahead and email you mine just in case too <laughs> right <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i'm like wait a minute who am i gonna email mine to <laughs> no all right you should have it Those PowerPoint files are pretty big, so it might take a second. Okay. This is where somebody needs to have, you know, like a little comedic routine. I know. I tell you what, I'm still waiting for that to come through. So I'm going to okay, do got mine. It. Is it working? Did you get it? Can you see my screen at yes, all? It. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Kind of oh, did like a I, back door. I don't no? see your screen. You can't? Does yet? Why is you? Do you see it? No, I'm not seeing it at all. Ugh. Okay, but I did get your, I, got, I, just, I just got your presentation here, Sarah. Okay, we'll do that. Give me a second. 
and you just tell me when you want mm -hmm. me to move forward, okay? Okay. That works. Give me a second to share my screen. All right. Should work. Okay. So my name is Sarah Fletcher. I'm the director of College Credit Plus at Eastern Gateway Community College. Um, I have a short slides here. There's not, I'm not going to keep a bunch of your time as Mr. Bean already went through the state's PowerPoint, but I'm just going to give you our deadlines in our process here at Eastern Gateway. So step one, as Mr. Bean already stated, is that you must turn in your intent to participate form to your school counselor by that April 1st deadline. The sooner, the better, even if you're thinking about it, um, because later on we've had many students maybe come August who have thought, oh, I want to do this, and they've missed all those deadlines. Um, so doing the intent form and actually applying at least gets you started on something, but you're never obligated. So just know that. So step two is applying to Eastern Gateway. Um, most of the high schools, I believe, that are on here tonight, we actually go to the high school and do the application day um, with the counselor and the students. Um, so that would be something like the students would want to make sure they're working with their counselor to know what day will be there for that application. Um, and But you can also go to our CCP website and apply um, on your own, too. That's available on the front page of Eastern Gateway's website. Um, some of the information that we make sure and to ask for students to have is they are going to need to know their social security number for the application. And then we do recommend a non-parental, non-high school personal email address for that student. Non-parental, so that way we have direct access to be able to help the student or troubleshoot if there is, you know, a password issue, things like that. Um, and then a non-high school email, because a lot of high schools have very high firewalls and we get blocked. Um, with most of our emails. So I have a lot of high schools that will apply with their high school email. I can't reach the students because our emails are blocked. So that's why we say use a personal email. Once the student applies, they're going to want to review the checklist email that they're going to get because in that email is embedded as a CCP permission form. Um, the state has a new permission form that the parent as well as the student must sign off um, and that way, you know, and they have to send that back. And that's part of our admissions process. So the student, regardless of them having everything in and say maybe they would be accepted, their application is going to pend until we get that permission form. Um, but we do ask that the student return the permission form from the same email address that they applied to the college with. So more of the application process. Since I work with most of the high schools or our college does in general um, that are on here tonight, you would have to have your high school transcript. This is just the regular process if you're applying to colleges in general. Um, but usually it's your counselor or the counselors at the high schools we work with that will send us the, the student's high school transcript. So we work very closely with them from the application day through the entire process as well as the students. Um, so basically the cumulative GPA is your ACT, um, SAT scores. The next slide is gonna show you just kind of what the state stuff on. Um, but mostly we look at the 3.0 benchmark score. If the student does not have a 3.0, which is the high school cumulative GPA, then we will come in and test the student at the high school. So that's something that we look at and we determine as part of the application process. So right here are the benchmark scores for the state of Ohio. So you have your ACT scores here, your SAT, as well as the next generation AccuPlacer scores. And that would be the test that we give if we do come to the high schools and the student does need to test. A lot of times it's more of your younger students that need a test. Maybe they're in seventh grade or eighth grade and they don't have a high school GPA. They would just have to test. Um, parents can always pay for an ACT, but with students being as young as they are, we offer the AccuPlacer, which is free to the student. Um, and we give that on the high school campus. Um, so we recommend them just taking the placement test for us. Okay, so what are our deadlines? So everything is on our CCP webpage. We actually have handbooks that go over the OSHA requirements. There's PDFs as well as like course um, substitutions from the state that highlights your high school substitutions as well as your middle school substitutions. But deadlines for application transfers and permission form are also right there on that front page. So when you click, you're gonna see these deadlines. So summer 24 is May 10th. 
Fall 24 is June 28th. And then for spring 25, it's September 27th. That is when the application date will close. So at when you see these dates on our website, it will actually tell you application closes on this date. So after that, then the student cannot can no longer apply for the CCP program. And then this is my last slide, um, but questions, um, if anybody wants our information, it's also on our CCP webpage, but it's right here as well. And I can put that in the chat. Um, I put our website as well as my information and the academic advisor that I work closely with, which is Mr. Carbon, I can put his information there too. We're always available if you want to contact us by email or by phone um, for general questions or you're not if you're not sure what to do. I mean, we're always here and we're happy. So if anybody has questions for me, you can put them in the chat. Thank you. Now I'll leave this on the screen for just oh. a couple more moments yeah. in case somebody wants to take a Take a picture real quick. So now I'll pull up mine. Thank you, Sarah. No, you, no problem at all. Thank you. So this is now um, information on applying to Kent State University. Let me. So as has already been uh, been said, I'm just going to reiterate step one is to do your intent to participate form. And remember, just doing the form does not obligate you to anything, but without it, you can't participate in the program. So make, make sure you do that form and turn it in to your counselor. Step two at Kent State University is are you a new student or a returning student? Because the process is slightly different depending on if you're a new student and uh, returning. So if you're a new student, you would need to complete the online CCP application. Uh, we have some deadlines here on the screen, April 15th for summer, June 1st for fall. We then have a separate permission form that needs to be completed. That form does require uh, a wet signature or a digital signature from both the student and or the parent slash legal guardian. We'll then ask your school for a high school transcript and using your transcript, we will determine if you are college ready. Uh, we, very similar to Eastern Gateway, we use a GPA. So if you have at least a unweighted high school GPA of 3.0, we will consider you um, academically ready for the program. Um, there may be some prerequisites for individual courses that are outside of that, but that is the standard. If a student does not meet that requirement or if they're a middle school student um, that's interested in taking the program, we too will come to the local schools and administer uh, the AccuPlacer test. And I'll agree that the AccuPlacer test is a better option, I think, than doing ACT or SAT. Number one, it's free. It's not timed. They can do it in the comfort of their own school. So that's certainly something that we can assist with if necessary. So that's the process for new students. If you're a returning student, you don't have to reapply. Um, what you would do is check your Kent State email address. So um, check your Kent State email. You're going to receive an email from either East Liverpool or Salem CCP admissions. It'll depend on where you applied uh, the first time. And you're going to answer three simple questions. As a returning student, you'll see this is an example, but it'll ask if you're still a student at the school you uh, attended this academic year. So if you're at Southern, are you going to be at Southern next year? Wellsville, East Liverpool, et cetera. Um, is your expected graduation date still the one you provided us on your original um, application? And then will you be continuing the program? And then you submit that and that's all we need. And then we will contact you to meet with your academic advisor in step three, where um, we can either meet with you on campus or, or what we're, we're, we're happy to meet with you via Microsoft Teams. We can still share a screen and see one another. Um, during this appointment, you're going to meet, um, you're going to discuss your academic goals, you'll explore your course options, even potential major options, and schedule your courses. And we even work with students that are bound for another college or university and do our best to really make sure that what you're doing while you're in the CCP program is going to benefit you wherever you end up. Um, so this is step three and really kind of the last step. After you've scheduled your courses, you go back to your counselor, let them know what you're planning, and then we make any changes that are necessary based on that. Um, we'll reiterate what Sarah Fletcher said um, from Eastern Gateway that using a personal email is very, very important because I will say I just had a student this week that wasn't receiving emails 
because she used her school email and her school was blocking them. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. And then I will pause for a moment so that if you care to, you can take um, a picture of this screen and um, we'll make sure that this information gets placed into the chat as well. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and pass it over to my colleague at YSU, Sarah Eisenhower. All right, well, let's, let's see if I can get this to work. Fingers I did crossed. get your presentation if necessary. Perfect. Can, oh. <laughs> All right, can you guys see my screen? Hey. And. Yep. All right, perfect. All right, so my name is Sarah Eismogel, and I'm here from YSU. Um, you guys went through a lot of information, so I'm not going to keep you guys very long tonight. First, we're just going to cover CCP eligibility and YSU admission. So to qualify for CCP eligibility and admission, you must meet all of the criteria for at least one of these two options. So AT ACT composite score 17 or SAT combined score of 920, and a high school cumulative unweighted GPA of at least 2.0, and a high school unweighted um, core GP of at least 2.0, at least one of the following ACT, SAT scores. So you don't have to have all of them. You just have to meet one of them. So let's say ACT English 18 or math 22 or reading 22 or SAT writing reading 480 or math 530. Um, or option two would be an ACT composite score 17 or SAT combined score of 920 in a high school cumulative unweighted GPA of at least 3.0 in a high school core GP of at least a 2.0. So you're probably wondering what happens if I don't have a qualifying ACT or SAT score. Um, so you can take the free CCP eligibility and admissions test. So to qualify for CCP eligibility and admission through this option, you still have to meet some criteria. So you still have to have a high school cumulative unweighted GP of 2.0 and a high school cumulative unweighted core GP of 2.0, at least one of the following scores. So um, we always come out and we test the students in AccuPlace or reading. Uh, it's a 20 question test. The students will receive the score at the end of that test. Um, a lot of the schools have us come out to give this test. However, if the school is not having us come out to give this test, you can go ahead and contact our office. So you would contact 330-941-2447. Let them know that you're interested in signing up for the eligibility test. Um, this is the test that we can actually give students virtually. So let's say you're not really sure if your student wants to participate or not. Call, schedule the test, they'll get their score, they can see if they can participate. If they do not get the score that they need the first time, they can retest. Um, but we do have some deadlines you have to be mindful of. So our test did open October 1st. It runs until um, March 1st to schedule if you want to take any summer classes. Um, you'd have to schedule by March 1st, have the test completed by March 15th. If you're interested in taking fall or spring classes, um, April 1st with completion by April 15th for that test. So if you want to take a second, take a picture of this to go ahead and uh, schedule a test session, please go ahead and do so. All right, so you're probably wondering how you complete your CCP application. So you first and foremost, make sure you submit that letter of intent to your CCP coordinator um, or your guidance counselor by April 1st. So even if you're on the fence, not sure if you want to do this or not, it's really important that you get that letter of intent in because if you miss that deadline, no matter what you do from that point on, you would not be able to participate if you miss that deadline. If you turn it in and you end up not wanting to do it, that's completely fine. You're not going to be penalized for it. You'll meet with your counselor. You'll discuss all the different options. Our application does go live in January. It's up on our website. So students are welcome to go ahead and complete it via our website. We do also have a step-by-step -step guide that guides the student through the process of completing um, application. Like with any other application, we do require a copy of the official high school transcripts, any ACT or SA scores, S ACT or SAT scores if you have them the parent consent financial responsibility form, a campus education plan for your student if they're planning on coming online or on campus with us. This plan just outlines any of the courses they still need to meet in order um, to meet graduation requirements at the high school and kind of gives us a good idea of what they're interested in. We'll also require any high school transcripts if they've completed any other college classes elsewhere. Um, we do have some deadlines for this, so if you're interested in taking summer classes, we need all of your application material by March 1st. 
Um, if you're interested in taking classes in the fall and spring, we need your application materials by April 15th. ACT deadline is April, SAT is March. All right, so I covered a lot of information. If you have any questions at all, please go ahead and reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help you and answer any of the questions you may have about this program. One of the really nice things too about uh, YSU, if you decide to go ahead and take classes with us, you are entitled to the same academic resources as any other student, including free academic coaching and tutoring, e-tutoring, the writing center, and the mathematic achievement center. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions for me. I'll leave this up for a second. And then, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. I think we did a stellar job ending because I don't see a lot of questions. I'm just going to attribute that to our our presentation. Um, so if you are um, on the meeting tonight and, and you have a question later, uh, all three of us would be happy to uh, communicate with you, to speak with you about any questions you might have and help you uh, through any struggles you might be having with an application or anything like that. Um, so thank you all so much for coming tonight and being a part of this meeting. Um, thank you to uh, the school counselors that helped put this together. Please let us know if we can be of assistance moving forward. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and a wonderful break. <laughs>